Good afternoon, everyone. I have um, Dr. Alice Lucas and James online on Teams, so I'm going to take five minutes of giving a sort of a broader overview of performance without barriers. It's a research group that I was lucky enough to found or create at SARC, Queen's University Belfast, about eight years ago, and I thought it would be very pertinent. I start off with our mission statement because we're always on a mission and there's nothing new to any of you in this room, but I do like to go into it for a moment just because when I have PhD students or uh, postdoctoral students, it's really important that we're all on the same, that we all sing of the same hymn sheet, so to speak. Um, we, I want people to think in the same way, to work in the same way and so on. So this is really what we're about and we're looking at the role of technology in removing access barriers encountered by disabled musicians uh, when they like to do their creative stuff, and it could be composition, performance, anything. Like many of you in this room, we are rooted in the social model of disability. For us, disability comes from the way, not just the way we think, the attitudes in society, but also, of course, the way things are designed, doorways and all this kind of stuff, knobs on door handles. So for us, uh, um, we use participatory design practices, and I know many of you have spoken about this, the reason why I've bolded these two things here, participatory and inclusive, because James is going to talk a little bit about participation and Alex will pick up on the inclusive part in their five minutes. Um, and so we are really very much about sort of bottom-up grassroots. We only work from uh, the insights of the disabled community. Uh, and we work, you've seen on the first slide, very closely with um, uh, Drake Music Northern Ireland. Um, Music for us in particular, and this is where some of my own strength and interest comes from, from improvisation research, the sort of horizontal way of thinking and the sort of yes and attitude. Uh, I've written a lot about improvisation, social inclusion, if you're interested. But music for us is that sort of powerful medium where we hope to help people with personal expressions and ideally kind of thinking about uh, amplifying voices of those that might be less heard in society. So, and again, the last point here is, it came up this morning as well, it's about how can we build sustainable environments for inclusive music making, something that lives beyond our research projects. It's a real challenge, especially when we have HSC funding that finishes after three years or three and a half years. Um, so allow me, I've put together a few slides and I'm not going to bore you with all the details, but I wanted to show you the sort of breadth and diversity of some of the things that have sustained the group and everything from funded PhD students from Northern Bridge to productivity investment, creative economy, engagement funding, follow-on funding, uh, collaborative studentships and so on. Currently Damien is working in immersive and inclusive VR, building instruments in VR. This goes back to a project that we already started in 2017 where we've made um, instruments uh, in VR for a, a, a disabled musician living with uh, cerebral palsy. And Leo, and again, Tim, I mentioned this briefly, is working um, with people with dement dementia and doing VR kind of immersive environments for and with them. Um, if you have spotted the paragraph at the bottom, there's the bit of bragging. And something we're very proud of is that um, our work in 2020 was recognized by our own vice chancellor. Uh, with a prize for research innovation. I still have a bit of money in the pot, so I can kind of say, oh, you can still have, go out for dinner from, from the bit of money that we got given. Um, and I, um, before I hand over to Alex, uh, I just wanted to give you an idea. And this is also, this slide I've put together so that you can see also about the sort of diversity and breadth of the partnerships. So not just Drake Music Northern Ireland, but we work with a professional music ensemble, Heart Rain Solist Ensemble. We've worked with um, immersive content designers, uh, be another lab, really interesting company based in Barcelona, uh, a makerspace in Belfast, Facet Lab. So we've had follow-on funding, we've had um, just standard research funding. The current funding, and Jacob is in the room, is with the Kuai uh, from Imperial College, uh, Professor Andrew McPherson, who I know many of you will know from his presentations and from his vast research in the sort of nine community. Uh, we're looking, it's a uh, project called Bridging the Gap, and we're working with visually impaired music producers, James being one of them, so I will let him speak on that pro uh, project in more detail. And I'm currently working on a bit on AI and diversifying uh, artificial intelligence uh, kind of algorithms, and I'm working with uh, Thor Magnussen in Iceland and with uh, Emily Howard in Royal Northern. 
Alex, over to you. So here comes my great skill of quickly swapping you over. You're on the call. So this is Alex talking about inclusion. Go ahead. <laughs> Hi everyone, thanks Francisca. Can, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, all that... good. Yep, great stuff. Um, so yeah, um, just to say I'm really delighted to um, have the opportunity to kind of share a few thoughts with you all today. Um, and then just a quick thank you to uh, Tom and Simon for re inviting me to speak. I'm really sorry I can't be there in person. It looks like a really fantastic uh, program. But hopefully next time, hopefully next time. Um, so I'm going to reflect on a couple of terms that we're all really familiar with, I guess. So that the first is inclusion. Now, what we're trying to do with Performance Without Barriers is extend the, the depth and the breadth of our inclusive practices. So regarding breadth, we're, we, we're sort of aiming to acknowledge and listen to both disabled musicians, but also the other key contributors in providing access uh, to music. So in this photo on screen at the moment, you this is, a, this is a typical Drake Music workshop in Northern Ireland, and pictured here is Dan, uh, an Access Music tutor who facilitates the session. So as researchers, we, you know, we only have some of the answers, really. Um, so in our research, we, you know, we strive to include people like Dan, family members, others in a care capacity, if that's, if that's relevant, um, and we benefit from, from their insights. Um, depth, uh, we, we value um, of course, including disabled musicians in the design process, but this isn't just because we need the insights of disabled people to design valuable and enjoyable instruments, but also because design, much like music, is a creative and enjoyable act. Um, certainly for me, you know, I probably enjoy both in, in, in equal measure. Um, so having a voice in shaping the tools that kind of furnish an individual's creative environment is, you know, I would say is extremely empowering and fundament fundamentally really just good fun. Um, the challenge we face, I guess, is that, and it's probably quite universal, is that you know, there are power dynamics at play even when following participatory design practices. So you know, an example of that is you know, as researchers, we often design, you know, we decide on the nature of the research questions, you know, what we're going to ask, when we're going to meet with disabled musicians, what feedback we are going to listen to or heed. So we, we acknowledge that power dynamic and we're working towards a more equal balance, I guess. And, and one of the ways in which we're doing that is recruiting uh, disabled academics to join the team, um, such as James. Um, so the second term I'm going to chat about is accessibility. So as Francisca mentioned, we're, we're currently conducting research to understand how visually impaired and blind uh, creatives use music software. Now we've realised, I guess, over the years that accessibility and usability are sort of inextricably linked really they're two sides of the same coin for us you, know, you can argue that the first step in making music software accessible to vib people is what you know exposing software parameters to the screen reader it's, it's also essential to ensure that those parameters are presented in a logical way otherwise the use of the software becomes arduous and presents a barrier in itself so we value um, intuitive designs, but on several tiers. You know, we want to squeeze the most out of the technology that we develop. And for us, that means ensuring that lower level aspects, such as codes and schematics, are easy to digest by other instrument makers, you know, in, in, in the view that they can be extended and repurposed, you know, it all kind of helps to kind of contribute something to the wider community and help to sort of sustain this, this practice, this very broad practice. Um, and we follow the view that you know system complexity is a constant and we need to kind of carefully manage that complexity you know considering all who interact with these technological artifacts that we're developing and to the parts that they might be exposed and then lastly um you know we we appreciate that the technology we develop will likely be a small part of a broader collection of tools of instruments you know particularly in sort of modern music making that uses sort of digital technologies so, you know, we, we really need to consider the, the positive or negative impacts of introducing new tools into such a complex ecosystem, you know, and, and, and the impact that, that has on an individual's music making practice. Um, so, yeah, just a few thoughts there. I hope that's really, I hope that's useful. I'm just going to hand over to James to have a chat about participation. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me in the room? Yeah. 
perfect. Um, so I'm James. Um, I'm a fully funded PhD. Um, and like Alex, I'm a member of the Bridging the Gap Project, which, as Francisco was saying, is part of this performance without barriers um, um, research umbrella here at Queen's. Um, so uh, Bridging the Gap has already been mentioned where we're looking at how visually impaired and blind music makers sort of use their digital audio workstations, the access barriers that they face, and the access strategies that they employ to you know combat those barriers. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how participation is a value that really has been present in our research and hopefully will be moving forward. Um, not unusual for this kind of event, I think. Um, so um, we started off by conducting a fairly hefty interview study with um, you know, visually impaired music producers, sound designers, performers sort of from all over. And we're currently working on a thematic analysis paper um, looking at this idea of how online, online communities have sort of arisen um, to, to sort of fulfil certain gaps. Um, you can see on this slide some of the insights that we've drawn out from that. Um, I wanted to highlight two. So one is that these communities are sort of very definitively communities of practice. You know, they fulfil that criteria and the practice they're sort of working with is, um, you know, VIP music making or sound creation. Um, and, and that's something that really needs to be taken into account because it, it sort of comes with all of these other um, attributes that you can see here. Um, and the other thing is that these communities have risen from a need uh, from access, which is really important because their participation is going to be required for any sort of social you know, progress or development or technological advancement, but also that kind of exist outside of this need for access now. They have their own identity, they're sharing their own knowledge, and they have this sense of community. Um, so Alex, next slide. Sure. Um, so, um, I should mention I am a, I'm severely visually impaired, um, and this has been really interesting for me on the project, participating as a you know as an academic. Um, you know, I can bring my own lived experience and my own unique perspective to the project, and sort of you know the same as our participants, and include that at all stages. But what I find really interesting is that kind of um, exchange. It's, it's it's an exchange. It's bi-directional, right? So. Um, I have been able to use stuff from the project insights from, from our research to sort of benefit my own musical practice and my, my own thinking as a visually impaired and blind person. Um, and, and sort of secondly, um, we, we've kind of come across this this, this barrier in, in the research process and academia in general that it's really difficult um, as a visually impaired person to research because things like quality of analysis softwares, things like publication um, softwares, things like Overleaf, Everything is just, it's access barrier after access barrier after access barrier. And I think it's really important that more disabled people participate in academic research if we're going to be inclusive. Um, but to do that, that's really going to have to change. Um, I, I have come to sort of develop my own practice through autoethnography and, you know, subjectivity and mining my own experiences. Um, and I think that I really want to combine that with some kind of, you know, academic progress over the next few years in the hope that it will sort of breed more inclusion um, in research more generally. Alex, next slide. Um, so the other value that I'm going to talk about very briefly here is this, this um, sort of holistic diagram. Um, we very much think of um, music making as, as ecosystemic. Um, and we don't look at people or technologies in isolation. Um, we instead look at you know people, artifacts, and processes as entangled networks, um, and these entangled networks are irreducibly complex. They're kind of beautiful in their own way, and they need to be studied really carefully, um, including the people who are in the networks, and um, with an acknowledgement that if you participate in studying these networks, you yourself become entangled within them, uh, and that's a principle that's really governed a lot of our research, you know, our choice of methodologies. Um, the insights we've drawn out, as well as you know, many of the other people within performance without barriers who sort of work under um, a similar kind of principle. Um, so that's all we've got for our presentation. I'll throw it back to the room if there's any questions. Just stick it on the thank you slide, Alex. So then it really looks like we're over. <laughs> so that that's uh, that's us. And I've just left some contacts so you, so you can find us performancewithoutbarriers.com and our email. So thank you very much. I hope that was right on time. Yeah, we've got one, well, one minute. Oh, we one have a minute. minute. <laughs> we've got one, one question. Anybody got one question? Quick question. I might point out that this final photo, and we actually was talking to um, uh, Christina about, so that's uh, Mary Louise, it was a performance we did in Switzerland. She was using a virtual reality instrument that we made for her. Uh, this is just the final thank you. We are bowing for the audience, but I, I love coming back to this picture because 
Uh, I, she inspired me to create my own blended instrument, so I play saxophone with one hand and I, I'm in the virtual world in the other hand and the two of us with our headsets, we basically make music together but then we take it off and, and we, we bow to each other and uh, I, I just love this because she reminds me, Chris, of you because she's so energetic and she always pus pushes us to do the next thing, you know, like, can you build me this, can you do me this? <laughs> so just to, yeah. But if, if there's time, we can also chat over dinner. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a nice thing to end on. So thank you yeah. very much. Guys, really thank you so much. I'm going to have to leave you. Uh -huh.